1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose, sorry, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay, he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, then an angel touched him, and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take my life, seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of, Ab of uh, Abel Mahol Maholah shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence, and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him, and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah, and ministered unto him. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you be with us today, Lord, and be with Brother Joshua as he preaches for us, Lord, and just help us to be edified by the message that uh, you have for us through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When the Lord speaks, when the Lord speaks, that's your topic for today. First, we're going to go to Luke chapter 11. We'll be back in 1 Kings chapter 19. Luke chapter 11 is where I'd like to start. When the Lord speaks, when the Lord speaks, <clears throat> He reminds you, first of all, who you are. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 37, the Bible says, And as He spake, a certain Pharisee besought Him 
to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisees saw it, they marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Now we see very quickly here, and this is what we've been talking about a little bit, is that the Pharisees, they like to clean the outside of the cup. Yeah. They love to make that outside of the cup sparkling and new and shiny and good, and then they show it off. But the reality is, is that the inward is what is often neglected. Inward, part of these Pharisees and their cup is full of ravening and full of wickedness. And here, I love this, and it says it so many times in the book of Luke, I find it's just emphasized even more and more, where it directly refers to Jesus Christ as the Lord. The Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So here's the con... Here's the contradiction. Here's the, the balance. Here's, here's what we're comparing here. We're comparing the outside to the inside. And in verse 40 down to 42, the Bible says, Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather, give alms of such things that ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So the inside is the judgment, is the love of God. The outside is the tithing of the mint and of the, the manner of herbs and all those things that they bring. The tithe is easily and quite easily an outward show. And the, the, the thing that's almost laughable of this situation is that they're a tithing of herbs. And I don't think these guys were keeping like a little herb garden. I picture the Pharisees as doing something much more extravagant than that. They're going to take the biggest bundle of herbs that they can from a great big harvest. And they're going to take off a big wad of it. And they're going to walk into the church at the time. They're going to walk into the synagogue. And they're going to bring this great tithe, this great offering in front of people. It's an outward show. I mean, even today, if someone was to come and they were to tithe of their, their bushels that they brought forth from the grocery store, or the great harvest that they got from their garden, I don't know if the, the context works the same in the city, but it would be something that is seen and, and, and viewed by many. And yet, Christ here is condemning them because they are cleaning the outside. They are looking good unto men, and they're ignoring the weightier matters, the inward part, the Bible calls it, um, that, that is judgment, that is the love of God. That is something that is not necessarily tangible unless the love of God is something like charity where it's actually acted out upon somebody. And yet these people had no interest in that. And yet God here, the Lord says unto them, hey, when you, when, when you show up, you ought to make sure that you clean both the outward and the inward. Hey, God made both of them. God cares about both of them. So if you just walk around and you're looking good, you're looking right, you're looking sharp, you're doing all the right things, you're tithing all the right ties, you're acting all the right acts, you're singing all the right songs, but your inness is full of wickedness and raveling, you're not. Yet the contrary wise is the same thing. Hey, you may be inward righteous, you may be inward doing the right things apparently, you may be studying your Bible, you may be reading, you may be singing, you may be watching all sorts of uh, sermons online, you may be a spiritual person, but if you're outward, if your outside is not showing it, well, James is clear that, hey, then that faith is dead, right? You have no works associated with it. God made them both, and God intends that both would be brought together in unity, and that would be the completed Christian life. Verse 45 says, Then answered one of the lawyers, and I love this because Christ just got finished saying, Woe unto you Pharisees! Woe unto you Pharisees! Woe unto you Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites! And then in verse 45, Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. So in that saying, you're also reproaching me. Hey, that's a cheap shot. This guy wasn't even involved in the conversation. But as the sermon continues, now he's going to say, all right, you don't like that, lawyers? You didn't like that? You think that hit a little bit too close to home? Well, woe unto you, lawyers. Woe unto you, lawyers. Woe unto you, lawyers. And he's just going to continue on with the sermon, but now changing the application over to these group. 
Their cry was, hey, don't rebuke us. Don't reproach us. But hey, what they need to understand is that Christ, the preacher, in his mind, wasn't even targeting the lawyers. He didn't even mention their name. And yes, they're like, hey, that sounds like you're taking a shot at me. Well, here's a clue, guys. Maybe you're guilty of that. Maybe you ought to just sit there, take that sermon as if it applies to yourself, receive that correction, recognize that you aren't as perfect as you think you are, and just take it. Just apply it to yourself. But no, they had to voice their opinion and say, hey, he's preaching that sermon against me. Well, now, okay, we'll make it applicable. We're going to hit a little bit closer to home. We're going to make sure that we hang out there a little while because you're obviously being convinced of the Spirit of God that you're wicked and you need to hear more of it. And that's exactly what Christ does in this case. So when God speaks, when the Lord speaks, the first thing that we see that he does is he reminds you of who you are. Now in verse 53 it says, And he said these things unto them. The scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So this is the complete wrong attitude. Look, when you're here and something seems to be hitting a little bit close to home, when you're listening to a sermon online, whatever it is, when you're reading the Word of God and something hits a little bit close to home, just take it. Even when I'm preaching a sermon unto you guys and I'm trying to love you, 99.9% .9 of times I have no one in particular in mind when I'm sitting there at 4 in the morning with the Bible open and I'm listening to what God says to me. Then when I stand up here, just as honestly as I can, I'm trying to deliver to you guys honestly what God had laid on my heart to preach. And if it hits close to home... Sorry, it wasn't my intent. I simply intended to present the Bible to you because the Bible it speaks for itself. Amen. So when I open the scriptures and I say something, you say, well, hey, that sounds like Josh is preaching on me. Don't give me a dirty look because I might end up staying there a little while longer. That's my job. That's my responsibility as the preacher. I want to make sure that I'm ministering to you guys in the best way I can. So if you like these lawyers are like, you're approaching us too. When I wasn't even in that ballpark, I wasn't even thinking about Brother Yuri's habit. I wasn't even thinking about that thing. But then when I say it, only because I feel the Bible said, and it was laid on my heart to say it, and he gives me a dirty look, I'm going to hit that a little bit further. Well, woe unto you, Yuri. Woe unto you, Yuri. Right? And if I don't do that, then, then throw me out. Because that's something that, honestly, every preacher ought to do. They ought to be willing to just say what the Bible says, give their interpretation, give their application, let the chips fall where they may, and not be fair, afraid of faces, and not be afraid of people that would be angry with them, people that would push back, people that would say, hey, that was about me, don't preach that again. No, it's my responsibility. And I am loving you when I decide I'm going to stick on a subject a little bit longer because you gave me a dirty look. I'm just trying to allow God to work through you. I'm not trying to browbeat you. I'm not trying to hurt you. But they had the wrong attitude. They said, ha, oh, you're reproaching us. You're rebuking us. That's wrong. And they ended up getting their just desserts. They didn't get more to come to them. But look at this. It continues down in verse 33 where now the Pharisees and the scribes they're now manning up, and they're just going to start urging him. They're just going to start provoking him. They're just going to start asking many questions. They're, have you ever read in the Bible things about many questions and the idea that when your ministry is all involved with questions? Ministering questions genders strifes. We find ourselves when we're constantly asking questions. I'm not just saying, like, hey, I have a question about this or this topic. When it's just a, the biggest part of your back and forth is just all these questions trying to provoke, trying to pull out something that, that you know, the, the one receiving the questions isn't necessarily seeing where you're going from. I feel it's wicked. Laying wait for him is what they did. They're trying to catch something out of her, his mouth. And that even happened just that this, this past week and this past little while, where my preacher... A respected man of God was approached by some man who had a false idea in there out of what they wanted to present him saying. And as they called him, and as they guided him through this conversation, 
they knew what they wanted to get out of him. They, like this group, was lying in wait for him, even sneaking behind the scenes and not necessarily allowing him to understand who is involved in this conversation, who is there, proclaiming themselves as if they're well-meaning and they just want to understand what's going on. But no, the reality was that they were lying in wait, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. And that's right. exactly what happened in this situation. I think it is one of the most disrespectful and wicked things you can possibly do to record somebody unawares to them and then use that as, a, as, a, as just a, a, something to hold against them. You gotta tell somebody when you have somebody else in the room. You gotta tell somebody when, and, and maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, I, I'm hearing that there's just recording software everywhere. And I'm not foolish to think that Google is, is watching and, and the New World Order and all these things. I'm, all, I'm constantly being recorded. I understand that. But can't we just act like men? Right. Can't we just approach a man face to face? Instead of getting on a phone, having your buddy whispering in the background what he wants to say, what his mentality is, what his idea of how the conversation should go, having in his mind a preconceived idea, and then portraying that as he ministers in questions, as he tries to pull out something. Oh, man, this, this burns me up. This makes me so angry. He was lying in wait, and we all know who we're talking about, and they know who we're talking about. But do you know what they're going to say? That reproaches me also with that saying. Hmm. Learn something! Learn something from the Bible! When I stand up here, like I said, I'm not trying to hurt people. When the Bible hits too close from home, grow. When the Bible hits too close from home, reflect. When the Bible hits too close from home, repent and get it right. Amen. Amen. When God speaks, when the Lord speaks, He's reminding you of who you are. And if who you are is, is, is a liar, if who you are is a backbiter, if who you are is a whisperer, if who you are is deceitful, if who you are is, you name it, fix it. It's simple. The Bible says you're wrong, fix it. When the God speaks to you. When the Lord speaks to you, when he tells you who you are, recognize that it's the Lord speaking. And don't blame the preacher. Don't blame the person that came to you with the scripture in humility and said it. See the only thing that burns me about this whole situation. You come up to the front, you put a Bible down, you don't even open it. You say none of this is biblical and the Bible doesn't even get cracked. Come on! Show me! I've been begging these guys! Show me where the Bible says I'm wrong! Yeah, you don't have a picture-perfect way of how a church starts, but you don't have a picture-perfect way of how it doesn't start. You can't just take gray area and say, well, that's not biblical because you don't find the Bible. You don't find toilets or toothpaste in the Bible. Give me a break. Number two, when God speaks, he reminds you of who he is. Job chapter 38. <clears throat> when God speaks, he reminds you of who he is. Job chapter 38. You go there. I'll start in verse 23. Look at this. Job has the right heart. <clears throat> Job's willing. Job's ready. Job's begging to hear from God. Job chapter 23, I'm going to read. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to a seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. In, verse, in chapter 31. 31, verse 35. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is the Almighty would answer me that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown unto me. Job is pleading that God would make a book. And praise be to God, Job had a book written. And it was, it was his story. You know, I, he's rejoicing in heaven. I can only imagine how many times he said, Oh God, oh that God would write a book. You know, that, oh that God would have, have that, that quick reference. Oh that I could just flip to the word of God. I could just have it before me. I would bind it to my shoulders. I would wear it as a crown. And this is one of the oldest books in the Bible that we know of. And then Job here is just pleading that he would have paper and black ink, that he would have the entirety of scriptures, and yet we take it, we take it for granted. Job is begging that he would have the word of God at his disposal. He's begging that God would speak. 
And when God does speak, first of all, we saw he reminds you of who you are. Next, we see he reminds you of who he is. Now, we see that the previous group that we were talking about, they asked for that conversation by their actions, by their wicked behavior. They were asking for God to speak to them. And the Lord spoke and he rebuked them sharply. Now, Job here, he is asking verbally, earnestly, begging, praying, hoping, pleading that God would please speak to him. And here he is, when the Lord speaks, Job chapter 38 and verse 1. The Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And this always amazed me. When I, when I first read Job, I was like, you know, these guys are just going back and forth. I was trying to follow the dialogue. This guy Elihu shows up, and I don't know if he's right or wrong, but he, he's condemning Job even more than the rest of them. And then the Lord answered. And it kind of took me by surprise. I was like, whoa, I was just expecting this to finalize, you know, with a scene in heaven or, or something like that that we saw in the first thing. But Job literally here answers Job, or the Lord literally answers Job of the whirlwind. Here's what he says. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for glory. Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed places, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto thou shalt come, but no further. And here shall the proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? And caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked man may be shaken out of it? And it's turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. From the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in search of the death? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. What's God saying here? You seem to think like you know it all. You're, you're acting like you know it all. You're proclaiming as if you know it all. Do you know it all? Here's just a few questions that I have. Hey, who shut up the sea? when it breaketh forth. Hey, who uh, laid the foundation of the earth? Hey, who took the clouds and made them a swaddling band? Hey, hey, have you, have you seen the gates of death? Do they open and close for you? Hey, hey, have you perceived the breadth of the earth? Tell me. You know it all, don't you? God is reminding Job here, God is reminding, I believe indirectly, of who the two friends, or who the three friends. He's reminding all of them. He's reminding who he is, specifically Job. Here's who I am. When the Lord speaks... He reminds you of who he is. And look, here's the right reaction. If you look in uh, Job chapter 40 there, in verse 1 through 5, he continues with these questions. I think there's like 70-something questions. I don't know if I'll tally up here. There's many questions he just keeps asking him. Hey, you know it all. You don't know it all, don't you? What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? There's all these great things of, of science that we're just discovering now. All these great uh, pictures of animals. All these great ways of how things work. All of these things that God has aligned in the stars and the sun, the moon. He's just asking him these questions. Hey, you know this? You understand this? Do you understand this? Can you comprehend this? Do you know how much this is? And he's just asking them all these questions and questions and questions. Speaking, revealing who he is. Look at this. Moreover, in verse 40, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Are you going to tell me what to do? God saying to Job, Are you going to instruct me of how I ought to move? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So I will answer the reproof. And then Job answered. Here's what it is. Here's what Job answered. Here's how Job responded. He said, What shall I answer thee? I'll lay my hand upon my mouth. When God reveals, when God speaks, when God says who he is, the best thing you can do is just... Right? And, and Job, I mean, perfect. 
perfect response. And Job was a perfect and an upright man. So when I'm saying that he's asking all these questions to Job, I wonder if, if he wasn't kind of directing them past at the other men that were sitting there. Because Job was perfect and upright. That doesn't mean he was sinless. That means he was balanced. He was a prayer. He, he, he prayed. He read his... He read his you know, he, he talked to God, he, he, he walked the walk, he talked the talk. All the well-roundedness that a person in Job's position could do in order to be pleasing to God, offering sacrifices that are well-pleasing, taking care of his family, having a big family, being a hard worker. He was perfect. He was rounded. He was a just man and then holy. And then when God comes to him with all of these things, and I believe Job was a very smart man. I believe he had great understanding of all these things. But when you're getting like question after question after question of things that are too high for man to understand, Job just goes, what shall I answer thee? Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay out my hold upon my mouth. Once have I spoken... I will not answer you twice, but I will proceed no further. I am not going any further. I have spoken against you wrongfully in that I blamed what was happening on you, right? Instead of accepting what is happening as just an, an outreach of your mercy and your love and your kindness to me. Job didn't speak wrong. The friends spoke wrong. But God spoke to him and Job in his humility said, I, I can't answer you a word. He, he says, I'm going to be quiet. I, I'm not going to talk back. I'm going to just allow God to speak. And look what, it does, look what happens now, right after that, verse 6. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind. Job has been waiting for this. So when God comes to him and starts revealing himself to him, Job's like, I'm just going to listen. And he gets more. Gird up thy loins now like a man, I will demand of thee and declare unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold everyone that is proud and abase him. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low. And there tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together, and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. These are all the things that the Lord Jesus Christ will do. He will take everyone that is proud and abase him. He will put them on the ground, and they will confess that Jesus Christ is God in the glory of God the Father. Amen. They will confess Jesus Christ's name, and they will finally, those that reject him on this earth, will plead. They will cry out and they will say, you were right, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Excellency, the Most High. They will finally praise him. And when one on this earth can do the same thing, then God will say, hey, now you can save yourself. <laughs> when you can abase the proud, when you can, I mean, I mean, come on, this is just, these are, these are just easy things to someone who would know all of which I've just outlined to you. Someone who would understand as God understands, but... Joe, but God here is highlighting man's weakness and highlighting man's ignorance, and he's comparing it to his own greatness. And in doing so, he speaks about who he is, and the revelation is such that, hey, Job just wants to receive it. Now, when the God speaks about who he is, be ready to receive. Look at, look at chapter 42. Chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that darkeneth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself in dust, and repent in dust and ashes. The right view was to receive God's proclamation, God's word. The right view is to understand and receive understanding, even ask back. He says, I will beseech thee. I will demand of thee to hear more of thee. That soft heart that Job had towards the word of God, remember we're talking about when the Lord speaks, that softened heart that Job had was one that even received the correction that was due unto another. The rebuke that was due unto another, Job applied to himself here. Look at that in verse 3. He says, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me. Do you know who it was that, that, that I believe hideth counsel with words without knowledge? Do you know who I believe was hiding the counsel 
by saying, by hiding what their actual counsel is, hiding what their actual purpose is by saying wrong and wicked things. It was Elihu. Because as soon as Elihu figured, figured on his rant that he was just going to correct all of these old men, he was going to tell all of these experienced men how it ought to be done. He was going to tell them who was right and who was wrong. I'm going to declare, are you ready to hear me? I am the young wise man. You're all old and gray-headed. I know exactly how things should come to be. That was Elihu, yeah. and, and, and he was rebuked by God. I believe primarily the rebuke fell upon Elihu here. And yet, Job, because he's humble, heard the rebuke of Elihu, and he applied it to himself. Job's thinking... Yeah, I probably said something that was out without knowledge. I probably proclaimed something that I understood not. I've heard you, God. I hear you speaking to me. And now, Maniah has seen thee. Job is probably half crying, half fearful, half laughing, half smiling from ear to ear. He doesn't know how to feel because he just finally had an experience. He just finally had what he'd been begging for. He is one-on-one -on -one with God. And when he hears the rebuke of another man, he says, Yep, that's me. I abhor myself in repentant dust and ashes. Job was right in all that he said. The Bible is clear on this. Job was right in all the things that he said. And yet God, when he speaks on who God is, Job hears that, applies it to himself, and says, yep, I repent. I have definitely said some things wrong. I have definitely uttered words without knowledge. I, I, I should just keep my mouth shut. I'm on the ground in dust and ashes, even more so than I was when I was mourning and weeping and begging for you to be here. Now that you're here, God, I'm just going to get deeper in the dust. God, you're right. I'm wrong. That's what the soft heart does when it receives correction. When God speaks, the soft heart receives Every word of God as if it was applicable personally to the softened heart. Grab hold of the right perspective and don't let it go. When you start to think that you're something, you remember who your God is. When you start to think you got it made, remember who your God is. When you start to think, I've got this figured out, this Christian thing I can do. I can walk the walk. I can talk to... Remember who your God is. Or don't be surprised when he reminds you who he is. That's exactly what he did here. God speaks, and when God speaks, He won. He reminds you of who you are. And secondly, He reminds you of who He is. Thirdly, go to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 19, this is where we started. So we see that He reminds you, when God speaks, He reminds you of who you are. He reminds you of who He is. And thirdly, He reminds you that you're not alone. He reminds you that you're not alone. I often use that illustration with people at the door. Just because I have a tie on doesn't mean I'm better than you. We're all on the same plane. We all have the same bar. We all have the same measuring stick. We are comparing ourselves to Christ. We are comparing ourselves to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God Almighty, sinless, spotless, perfect, without blemish, Son of God. That's our measuring stick. And so when I stand with you just because I have a tie on, doesn't mean I'm somehow better. Just because I don't do X, Y, and Z, and you do A, B, C, doesn't make me better. We're standing on the same plane when we stand next to the Son of God. But God reminds us, yes, first of all, who you are, second of all, who He is, and so you got your perspective right, He's going to remind you that you're not alone here. Now look at in verse 1 of 1 Kings. Chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do unto me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he rose, went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So we see here, Elijah, who had just done this great miracle before God, God using him greatly to call fire down upon the prophets of Baal and destroy many of them. He is now standing opposite a woman, a Jezebel. He's standing opposite her and she's saying, you're going to die by this time tomorrow. And this great man who had destroyed many great men simply through his prayer and his faith in God is now wavering. And he went for his life. Man, this guy you, you got to wonder what happened between chapter 18 and chapter 19. Now, he's just going to run for his life. Or that's just a true testimony of the kind of heathen witch that Jezebel was. But regardless, 
He flew. He fled. He's running for his life. And I love this, though, right at the end. I, I almost missed this every time I read it. And left his servant there. We're gonna, that's going to be an interesting statement a little bit later. He went. He made this carnal decision. He went for his life. And whenever you are seeking for your life, what does the Bible say? If you, if you seek life, like you'll lose it. Whosoever shall... Quote it. Can you quote it? <laughs> but the Bible says... Whosoever shall seek to save thy life shall lose it. Right, exactly. And this is what he did. He, he lost his life. And as he walked away, he, he, he lost his life to the point where he's, God, just take it. He just, just take my life. Look at this look. Look at verse 4. He says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. He sought for his life. He went for his life. And now he's here and he's like, I might as well just lose my life. I wonder if it was the shame of running from the woman. I wonder if it was just the embarrassment of now standing alone. He was at this great event. Everyone is probably still talking about it because only one chapter has passed. And yet now he is fleeing for his life. He is ashamed. He is cast down. He is at this all-time low. And he requested for himself that he may die. And he said, it is enough. Now, oh Lord, take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. He's comparing himself amongst men. He's like, I'm not better than my father's. I'm not able to overcome as much as they did or the same as they did or more than they did. I'm not better. I'm worse than them. Look at this in verse 5. God sends help. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So that was the provision of God. God, yes, has not spoken to him yet, but he has seen a great miracle. He's seen great acts. And now he's facing some persecution. Now he's facing some flack from the enemy. Now he's facing certain death from the woman. He crawls away and in, 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 in remorse and in sorrow, he begs, God, just take my life. I'm not better than my father's. And yet God here still provides the angel to provide the sustenance the first time and the second time. And that angelic food was enough to have him to survive, to go in the strength of that meat 40 days. I believe, and I hazard to say that we have the same thing available to us. That bread and that water from the angel that today is available to us is none other than the preaching of the word of God. The angel or the evangel or the evangelical, like the evangelist, it's a synonym for that term Angel, messenger, the preaching of God's word. He went in the strength of two days worth of the preaching of God's word for 40 days. That sustained him, though he was at a point unto death. Though he was facing persecution. He heard the word of God. God spoke to him through the pages of the Bible in the way that they had it, right? Through the preaching of the word by the angel in typology, in, in type, right? He received that, that food. He received that sustenance and was able to go in the power and the strength of that for 40 days. <clears throat> but next we see, if you look in verse 10, and he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord thy God. I'm missing it. Verse 9, let's say, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, here it is, The word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? So he has already received sustenance of the angel. And that was enough to sustain him for the 40 days. And yet now here, what would be deemed open vision to Elijah is what we would deem exactly what it said. It said, it said the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. So the Bible came unto him. Not only does he have the preaching to sustain him, he now has the word of the Lord. And it is here to direct Elijah. It is here to speak to Elijah. And it's amazing what the word of the Lord says. What doest thou here, Elijah? What doest thou here, Elijah? And how often do you open the Bible and you're like, what in the world am I doing here? What am I doing with my life? What have I done? What doest thou here, Elijah, the Bible says. What doest thou here, Elijah, the word of the Lord says unto him. Have you ever had these, what are you doing here moments? Have you ever had those opportunities in your life where God reveals something, first of all through the angel, second of all through the word of God itself, where you just said, you're just like, 
what in the world am I doing here? And that's not very comforting, is it? It's not very comforting to have God to be, to be waiting to hear something big from God. A big miracle just happened, and finally the word of the Lord arrives to you, and all he says is, what are you doing here? Now, Elijah responded in the same way. He just pleaded out more. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. That's where I think it's funny, because in verse 3, he left his servant. So even if he had just taken his servant with him, he, only he, wouldn't be the only one left. But he said, go forth, and here's God speaking in verse 11, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. The Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So he pleads out. He, he says, God, I've been zealous. God, I've been, I've been, I've been trying. I've been, I've been working with these people. These people have forsaken. They've slain the prophet. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that believes this. I'm the only one that follows you. And you know, more times, more, more time passes. There's time in, in meditation here. There's time in, in wonder. But God here follows it up with the trials. Hey, you may be hearing preaching from God after after that you have had attacks. After that you have had. Jezebel come barking down your door. After that, you've had, you know, a great victory perhaps. Things were going great, but now you're at this new low. You've heard the preaching. Now the word of the Lord is coming to you. And God simply just says, hey, come stand before me. And, and you know, what are you doing here? Come stand before me, is what he says. What are you doing there? Come stand before me. And now enters in the trials. Look at this. The strong winds, they threaten to push you over. There's earthquakes in your life. They're shaking you to the very core and foundation. Now there's fires here that try you. There's fires that purge you. There's fires there. And their purpose is, 